So, good afternoon and welcome on behalf of the Bloomington Bob Katana Project. I'm Dan Malamed, director. We present Katana's by Johann Sebastian Bach in performances modeled on his own. In the musical text we use, in the versions we present, and in the performing forces that we apply to these pieces, modeling them as closely as possible on what we know about his performances. And we combine that with an opportunity to learn a little bit, something more about the piece and its context. Uh, this is a musical experience of the sort I don't think you'll get uh, pretty much anywhere else. Uh, before we turn to today's performance, uh, a couple of announcements. First of all, we have one more performance in this year's season, and that will be on Sunday, March 26th, a month from now, uh, where our director will be John Blundell, right here, uh, directing the cantata Preise der Glücke Gesegnete Sachsen, cantata 215. It is as spectacular a piece as today's cantata is intimate. It's a secular work for the visit of the Saxon elector and Polish king uh, to Leipzig, and Bach goes all out in that piece. Trumpets, drums, military flutes, a double chorus. Uh, this is an event uh, not to be missed, so please join us in a month. And the other announcement is that the work of the Bloomington Bach Cantata Project is made possible by the generous support of donors. And today marks the start of fundraising for next season, which will be our 14th. That's a good Bach number, some of you might know. We've been fortunate to uh, raise enough money to support ourselves the last 13 years. And putting on a 14th season depends on, once again, having sufficient support. We've made a good start with some very generous recent donations and are now asking for your support as well. Um, if you're able, this would be the time to make a donation toward our work next season so that we can spend the summer planning and engaging uh, performers uh, to guarantee that season. You can donate to us by check. The address is in the program. Uh, there's also a QR code to scan in the program and another copy on the table there. There's also a donate button on our Facebook page. Everybody who enjoys these concerts, uh, either as performers or as listeners, will be grateful for your support. Our routine, as many of you know, is to hear a performance of the cantata, uh, a short talk about it, and then another performance in which, as we say every time and read every time, we hope you hear new and different things. Thank you and welcome.
Those of you who were here last month for our discussion of Cantata 101 will be glad to hear that although there is some pretty important Lutheran, Lutheran theology to consider today, it is nowhere near as grim as the last time. <laughs> and in fact, offers some new ways to listen to the piece that you might actually enjoy. <laughs> So, the, letter, the libretto for Nun Kom der Heiden Heiland, BWV 61, is by the Hamburg theologian Altmann Neumeister. He's pretty famous as the originator of the so-called mixed text-type libretto. That is, a libre cantata libretto that mixes scriptural texts, hymn stanzas, and, most importantly, free, newly composed poetry designed to be said as arias and recitatives. This is the kind of piece he called, and we have come to call also, cantatas. The piece we just heard is one of Bach's earlier church cantatas composed during the years he worked in Weimar, and it was performed at the Weimar Court Chapel probably for the first time in 1714. It's thus one of Bach's very first compositions of this new type. Now the version we're hearing today is from Bach's reuse of the work in Leipzig in 1723, his first liturgical year there. We can't be absolutely certain about that because we don't have any Leipzig era performing material. But Bach clearly pulled this piece off the shelf in that year. because We know this because he wrote down the order of the musical parts of the worship service on the inside front cover of the score. And that fit, his use of the piece in First Sunday in Advent for that year fits with a pattern of his using or reusing pieces he'd already composed whenever was possible in that first year in Leipzig, which would otherwise involve the weekly composition of a new cantata. So why did Bach choose this piece in which to notate the order of service? It's symbolic, this piece is for the first Sunday in Advent, the beginning of the church year. And he did the same thing, interestingly enough, a year later, in the score of a new work he composed for that occasion, which also begins with the text known called Heiland and Heiland. In the, in the inside of the wrapper for that score, he renotated the order of service. So we have two annual cycles that began um, with that indication. The first Sunday in Advent is a liturgical beginning. It was one of two beginnings of the liturgical year for Bach himself. He organized his cantatas beginning not with Advent, but with the first Sunday after Trinity. And that's because the first Sunday after Trinity was the first Sunday in Leipzig in which he for which he composed and performed uh, a new cantata. And of course, um, this uh, coming liturgical uh, year will be the 300th anniversary of that event. And as it happens, not this part of the year, uh, but once we get into the new year, um, the liturgical, the, the calendar dates and the liturgical dates will line up for the rest of the year precisely. So that on a given day, if you choose on a Sunday, unless you're coming here to hear whatever, um, you can listen on the 300th liturgical anniversary and date anniversary. And that happens because, as it happens, um, Easter falls on the same uh, day of the year um, in 2023 as it did for Lutherans uh, in uh, 1723. Ask me after why. <laughs> At any rate, Bach organized his cantatas based, uh, his cantatas uh, in cycles beginning with the first Sunday after Trinity, and we know that partly because the pieces for that liturgical date were clearly on top of the piles by annual cycle that he kept in, uh, in the composers, in the, the Contra's office. So there's another symbolic element here. Uh, the libretto for this work is from a published collection of cantata librettos that contains a complete annual cycle. And it also, as is typical, starts with the first Sunday in Advent. It's the first text, so the very first text of the very first cantata in the volume is the hymn stanza, Nun komm der Heiden Heiland. Now come, you savior of the, uh, of the heathens. Um, that is the first stanza of the most famous Advent, Lutheran Advent hymn, and it dates from the very earliest days of the Reformation, and is based on a Latin hymn, Veni Redemptor Gentium. Every Lutheran hymnal begins with Advent and always begins with this hymn. Any Lutheran hymnal you open from the 18th century begins Nun Kom Der Heiden So this book of librettos opens just like a hymnal, 
that and this and in both cases this clearly in itself signifies a beginning and an entrance. Now Bach's setting of this chorale stanza at the beginning of the cantata libretto makes this clear. The first movement is set as a kind of piece called an overture, an overture. It's a kind of work that had its origins in 17th century French court music. It was the, an overture was the first instrumental piece of operas, ballets, and all the hybrid genres that were cultivated at the French court. And it was the opening instrumental piece of formal court social dance. So an overture came to symbolize a beginning, but it was also associated with the entrance of the king. It was the royal entry music for both for uh, social dancing and for theatrical events. And very often, as you might know, in the 17th century French court, those two things uh, overlapped closely. And so this is music, uh, the, the kind of music Bach picks, is music of royal entry with obvious meaning to uh, the believer for, uh, for Advent. The musical construction of an overture is in two parts. It's got a slow section, that's the entrance music, known as the entree grave, the slow entrance. Um, and it's got characteristic, jerky, long, short rhythms. Then follows a fast section, here in a dance-inspired uh, in triple meter, and has lines, this faster section has lines that imitate each other in close succession. And the characteristic French way of doing this in, in an overture is to have that imitation start at the very top in the upper lines and work their way down to the bass. Um, and that's precisely what happens here. Now into this overture, an instrumental type Bach unexpectedly works a chorale tune, Nun kommt der Heiden Heiland, first in slow notes in the instrumental bass uh, as the piece opens, and that's striking enough. But then in slow notes in the soprano as a kind of cantus firmus, a, a sung out slow line over other material, then in the alto, and then repeated in the bass and, uh, and tenor for vocal lines, all repeating Nun kommt der Heiden Heiland, now come, you Savior. So four vocal and two instrumental statements of Nun Kong. The second line of the hymn stanza brings the slow section to a close, and then the third line is set in the fast sections, with voices now taking on the role of instruments in that top-down imitation. The voices double the instruments in the, in the overture, um, and that imitation of violin one, um, violin two, viola one, viola two, basso continuo, is doubled by soprano, alto, tenor, bass. And then there's a characteristic return of the slow opening music to set the last line of the chorale for all the voices. So the use of this tune in the libretto and its role in hymnals probably also points not just to the church year, but to the church itself. Both topics, the new year and the church, are made explicit in the text of the aria number three. Come, Jesus, to your church and grant, uh, grant a blessed new year. Come, Jesus, there's that word, come, once again, and a reference uh, to the new year, because this was, of course, a liturgical new year. The aria musically beautifully illustrates one of Bach's most important techniques for composing an aria. It opens with a unison string ritornello, that passage the strings play together, that uh, will recur throughout the piece. So violins and violas uh, together. And it's designed to take, as you might have heard, full advantage of the lowest note on the violin. There's an open G most of the way through that just rings out. Um, and then the vocal line will begin with this same tune as in the ritornello. But the singer will very quickly hand that melody back to the strings, who will play a full statement of the ritornello with a few breaks here and there, while the voice is singing new material and providing the text. So after the vocal statement, there's another ritornello, literally, to complete the A section of this A, B, A aria. So the strings play the ritornello three times, twice on their own, and then once in between with a vocal line built in. Now that's musically interesting, and it shows the leading role of instruments, not voice in an aria like this. But it also has a consequence for the presentation of the text. It frees up the voice to allow many repeated statements of the word call, come the exhortation to Jesus. And that repetition is first of all built into the text, come Jesu, come, it's, uh, it's repeated there. But also in the vocal explanations in the tenor line, come, come, as you'll hear and we'll hear, I counted this word 13 times in the A section when I looked at the score. So it's a musically concentrated and efficient aria. It took a relatively small amount of composition to come up with that ritornello and then build an aria. The same could be said to be true for the second aria, number five, Efne Dishman Ganz Herze, 
That's the one with basso continuo only, where the continuo instruments serve both as the bass line that supports the harmony and as the melodic interest in the ritornello. Also an ABA aria. And in the A section, you will hear that it is built on multiple repetitions, one after another of this bass line. An opening ritornello, a broken off statement that's started by the voice and then completed by the continuum, a vocal statement that's based on the ritornello, another instrumental ritornello, another vocal statement based on it, and then the closing instrumental ritornello. It's just a series of repetitions of it. Efficient, again, but also emphasizes the opening words of the text. Ifnidish, it's addressed to the believers, the speaker's heart, open yourself um, to Jesus. I'll come back to that point in just a minute. The voice sings this three times, but you can also hear the instruments sing it in addition. Ifnidish, yadadam, and you'll hear that. And if you count all of those, um, the instruments sing it an additional eight times, all leading to Jesus kumt und on Jesus comes and moves in. So um, that kind of repetition is really important, and it keeps being focused on things related to this word, come. Um, repetition plays an interesting role in the recitative number two. It begins, of course, with a key word, the Heiland ist gekommen, the Savior has come. It's a so-called simple recitative, it's declamatory and speech-like, with no word repetition. But its last two lines are presented in tempo in a kind of music known as arioso, aria-like, or mezz-aria, halfway to aria. And this often appears at the end of a recitative. Here, the most interesting feature of it to my ear is that it allows repetition of text, a threefold statement of du kommst, du kommst, du kommst, emphasize of that word, word at the end as well as at the start of the rest. And then the final movement uses that word, to come du schöne Freuden kommen. Clearly, this is the theme of the cantata for Advent, addressing Jesus. Come. Now, that uh, 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 exhortation to Jesus to come to the believer is realized in a way I think we can only call theatrical. In the other piece marked recitative, that's number four, with instruments, not just basso continuo. This is a scriptural text from Revelations. It's direct quotes, direct words of Jesus, at least according to. John, the author of that book, Jesus stands at the door and knocks. Uh, Luther says he knocks with the hammer of the law or with the hammer of the cross. Um, and Jesus has indeed come in, in this cantata, in that movement. The musical setting is obviously pictorial, the bass voice representing Jesus, and the plucked strings don't, don't represent the knocking. So Jesus having arrived in the recitative number four, he is welcomed in the aria number five. The final movement then asks once again, amen, amen, komm du schöne Freude, komm. There's that word again, komm. It's in long notes in the soprano supported by komm, komm. Now this last text is actually a chorale stanza, or to be exact, it's the last lines of a stanza. It's the last few lines of a stanza of a chorale, wie schön leuchte der Morgenstern. And that chorale is addressed to Jesus. And the words that it opens with, Amen, Amen, is not just the prayer ending, Amen, Amen, right? It's not just the prayer ending. But if you read the passage in John, just before the, in Revelations, excuse me, just before this, um, uh, Revelations, John calls Jesus this Amen, this faithful and true witness, the origin of God's creation. So Amen is here, a name for Jesus. So this is an address to Jesus. Amen, amen. Come, Jesus, Jesus, come. That's why that word is, is, uh, is there and is emphasized in that way. Now the context of the hymn makes it clear that Jesus is addressed here as bridegroom. You don't necessarily see that from the text that's quoted, but the entire rest of the hymn and the stanza, this is the end of, addresses Jesus as bridegroom, and that is clearly apocalyptic. It is a, represents the metaphorical wedding of Jesus and the believer in end times. So this cantata actually finishes with the image of the last judgment. But how did we get here from the beginning of this piece for the first Sunday in Advent? This turns on a particular Lutheran understanding of the idea of Advent. Advent is not just the anticipation of the birth of Jesus. Lutheran doctrine actually taught that there were three advents of Jesus. The first one is Jesus' birth in Bethlehem in human form, and that's the one that's commemorated.
celebrated in Advent, the period before Christmas, right? The second Advent is Jesus' presence in the bread and wine of the Eucharist, of uh, communion. And the third Advent, according to Luther, is Jesus' return, return at end times, what tends to be called the second coming in many Christian denominations. Uh, so, birth in Bethlehem, first Advent, presence in the bread and wine of communion is second Advent, and return in end, end times is third Advent. And the remarkable thing about this libretto for Advent is that it invokes all three. For the Advent season, meaning the pre-Christmas season, it uses a Christmas hymn at the beginning that invokes Jesus' human birth to the Virgin Mary. Um, that's in the first movement, and then that idea is continued in the second and third. That's her first Advent. Then, Jesus is present in, presence in communion, that's the second Advent. The Rechtative uh, number four invokes Abendmahl, the evening meal, literally the evening meal, but it is also a Lutheran term for communion. Um, and the aria that follows uh, that invites Jesus into the heart. The heart was understood to be the seat of Jesus' indwelling in the believer, where Jesus resides in the believer, um, often as a result of the second advent. And that's why the second advent aria says, if the dish my God says, how to, it's to receive the Jesus of the second advent. And then Jesus is finally invoked as the bridegroom in the final chorale number six, uh, a return awaited with longing, as you hear. That's a Song of Songs reference, of course. It's an Amherst reference. But it is also a reference to the believer's longing for end times and the return of Jesus there. Here's your third advent. So a work that begins with a royal entrance marking the beginning of a new church year moves through Jesus' presence to the believer and indwelling in the heart, the second advent, and to a longing for Jesus' return, the third advent. All summoned with a word Bach continuously musically underlined in this piece. Thank you. 